about nuclear energy. We hear a lot about all of the above policies in the energy domain. We need everything. Uh, but I want to be more specific. I'm going to stipulate that it doesn't seem credible that the world is going to be able to achieve these very deep reductions in carbon emissions called for by the climate science community and from time to time by political leaders, and at the same time have even modest economic growth without a major expansion globally in, in nuclear energy. Now, there are some who flat out don't believe that, and there are probably many others who don't want to believe that. Uh, and we can return to that in the, in the discussion period. But the question I want to talk about here in this section is not whether that's right or not, but rather how might it happen that we would have a major global expansion in nuclear energy? Not whether it should happen, but how might it happen? It's now, as we probably all recall, nearly, almost exactly actually, uh, uh, two years since, since Fukushima. And certainly the near-term prospects for nuclear energy look uh, less favorable than before the accident. But predictions in the immediate aftermath of the accident that it would spell the end for nuclear power have turned out to be uh, exaggerated. People who watch the polls here in the US have noticed that there hasn't actually been a very significant shift in the level of support for nuclear energy. Although the people who were opposed to further development before have certainly become more energized in their opposition since the accident. But the uh, level of support doesn't seem to have changed very much. It's useful to divide the world beyond the United States into four uh, groups of, of countries. Uh, the first consists of those countries, mostly advanced economies, that have said, we're going to get out of this. We're going to leave the field. And this includes Germany, Italy, Switzerland, and possibly, although not certainly, Japan itself. The second and somewhat larger group of countries includes those whose plans for nuclear expansion haven't really changed very much since Fukushima. China is the largest of these and alone accounts for something like 40% of the 65 or so plants that are currently under construction around the world. But if we also add in Russia, India, and Korea, at least 80% of those plants that are under construction uh, uh, or for which planning is underway uh, are in countries whose plans for nuclear development aren't greatly different after the accident than they were uh, before. The third group of countries consists of those that for different reasons and in different ways are basically treading water. This includes the US, in a different way France, Sweden, Canada, Brazil, and, and maybe one or two others. And then there's the fourth group, in many ways the most interesting group, uh, the fairly sig large number of countries that are embarking on nuclear energy programs for the first time or are seriously considering it. Uh, this, uh, well, uh, th this group certainly has got smaller since Fukushima, uh, but the International Atomic Energy Agency recently estimated there's anywhere between 15 and 30 countries, depending on whether you include those that are seriously considering a program but haven't yet made a final decision to proceed. So it's clear from this list that nuclear energy will continue to be a significant contributor to global energy supplies. But even if you add up all of the plans in both the current nuclear countries and the newcomers, the fact is that that commitment isn't enough to have a big impact when it comes to reducing global carbon emissions. And so here's the basic puzzle that I really want to talk about. On the one hand, the world has little or no chance of having even a modest rate of economic growth while avoiding the worst risks of climate change without, I stipulate, a large-scale expansion of nuclear energy. On the other hand, when you look at what the world is actually planning to do about nuclear energy, 
it doesn't add up. We can look at some more numbers here, or some numbers. The International Energy Agency recently made a projection of what would have to be done to prevent an increase of more than two degrees C in the global average surface temperature by the end of the century. It's a more ambitious goal uh, than I was describing previously, and, and maybe even beyond reach. Now, I point out that there are very big uncertainties here, uh, and I'm not going to belabor them. But for our purposes, the bottom line of the IEA's uh, calculation is that the global nuclear fleet of reactors would have to be meeting about a quarter of the world's electricity needs by the year 2050 in order for us to have the possibility of meeting this uh, two degrees C goal. And that, in turn, would require an installed capacity of about 1,200 gigawatts, 1,200,000 megawatts of nuclear capacity compared with 370 gigawatts today. In other words, another way to think about this is that we would have to build more than twice as many nuclear plants in the next 40 years <coughs> as we built uh, in the last 40. And in fact, since much of the current fleet of reactors, about 400 of them around the world, would have to be retired before the year 2050, the requirement for new build would be larger still. Uh, this, is, uh, this shows the rate at which we would have to build new nuclear plants around the world uh, in order to meet that uh, IEA requirement. Um, as a point of reference, it would mean completing new nuclear plants at an annual rate at least as large as what the world achieved during the peak years before Chernobyl in the mid-1980s, but doing that every year for the next 40 years. Not an impossible task, not an impossible task, but a very formidable one. So what would it take to achieve this kind of uh, expansion? Let me just mention three challenges. There are many others, but I want to focus on three things here. First, I think it hardly needs to be said how important it's going to be for the international nuclear community to learn the lessons of Fukushima. Even today, there's a lot we don't know about what happened. But it's already very clear that just as at Three Mile Island and Chernobyl uh, decades before, there was a breakdown of governance at Fukushima, of the systems of management, control, and regulation. The proximate cause of the accident, of course, was a, a physical event, the earthquake and the tsunami. But at Fukushima, just as at Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, the consequences of that physical event were magnified by what engineers like me, sometimes disparage as the soft issues, the performance of humans, of human beings, the institutional structures that they create and the procedures that they follow. And those breakdowns aggravated what might otherwise have been a very serious but manageable accident. And of course, it's the breakdown of public trust in these institutions that surely will turn out to be one of the costliest legacies of the accident especially in Japan. Another lesson of Fukushima is that failures of nuclear governance can occur anywhere. It's worth pointing out that the three most serious breakdowns of this type that uh, occurred ever in history occurred in vastly different national settings. In the United States, in the then Soviet Union, and now in Japan. And that covers a very wide range of economic and cultural and institutional industrial environments. At the very least, it uh, indicates that it would be unwise for nuclear leaders in any other country to assume that it could never happen to them because somehow they're different. They're not like the US, they're not like Japan, and so on. On the contrary, we might reasonably conclude on the basis of the evidence that we have that there's no national system within which major failure cannot occur. But it's also clear that there are some universal principles of effective nuclear governance that we expect would apply everywhere, regardless of national context. Principles like 
transparency of decision making, independence of regulatory, uh, of the regulators, and the overriding importance of establishing and maintaining a safety culture in nuclear operating organizations. So the first and most important challenge confronting the international nuclear community is that both the existing nuclear countries and the new entrants must fully embrace these principles and implement them with the highest standards of dedication and quality. And that is surely the most important lesson of Fukushima. The second, and I would say equally important challenge for the international nuclear community concerns technological innovation. If nuclear power is going to expand around the world, a technology that is already safe must be made demonstrably safer, as well as less expensive, more secure against the threats of nuclear proliferation and terrorism, and more compatible with the capabilities and the limitations of most electric power systems and the utilities that operate them. And to these familiar goals relating to safety and waste and cost and non-proliferation, we must add one more, and that is cycle time. Because in the nuclear area, everything, whether it's facility planning, siting, design, regulation, licensing, construction, R&D, whatever, demonstration, waste disposal, everything now takes so long in much of the world that it is unlikely that the global nuclear power industry could grow by a factor of three or more between now and 2050, even if nuclear power plants were cost competitive everywhere. There simply aren't enough cycles to allow that to happen. Now, long lead times to build physical infrastructure of all kinds are now common around the world. To some extent, this is what happens when you have economic progress. In advanced societies, deliberation in environmentally sensitive uh, uh, projects is seen as a virtue. And even now in China, we read that there will be a social risk assessment stage that will be required before the siting of major industrial facilities. But nuclear projects are the longest of the long. And since it's now routine, even in advanced countries, to be able to build a few hundred megawatt natural gas fire combined cycle plant in three years or even less, the much longer lead times required for nuclear projects are a serious competitive disadvantage. So innovation to improve safety, to reduce costs, and to reduce cycle times is the second challenge facing the international nuclear community. And by the way, that is a different agenda, uh, a different innovation agenda from what has historically been the primary and in some ways exclusive focus on uranium conservation through breeding. The third challenge that has to be overcome uh, is to rapidly increase the size of the nuclear workforce. It's difficult actually to find reliable estimates of how many people worldwide are engaged today in nuclear-related activities. But we do know that it runs into hundreds of thousands of people. And we also know that this workforce is graying. Here in the United States, uh, where the average age of nuclear employees is about 50, uh, one uh, research institute estimates that almost 40% of the 56,000 strong uh, workforce of the nation's operating nuclear plants will be eligible for retirement over the next uh, five years. So what progress are we actually making in these three areas? Those are three important challenges. How well are we doing? On the question of nuclear governance post Fukushima, uh, it's probably still too early to say. National governments are paying attention, but it's clear that stronger international efforts will be needed to drive the reforms that are going to be necessary and our existing international institutions are limited in what they can do. On the question of technological innovation, well, there's quite a bit happening. Much of what's happening is focused on developing advances in, in today's light water reactor technology. The next generation of light water reactor technology does offer 
significant safety advantages uh, relative to earlier designs, but it has to be said that the high costs, the delays, and the cost overruns that are being reported at some current projects, including in France and in Finland, are a cause for serious concern. In parallel with, with that, there are a number of innovative reactor technologies that are under development by firms around the world. In the US, these include the well-funded, Bill Gates-funded, at least partly, startup TerraPower, another uh, company, another new startup called NewScale, and, and a number of others. In China, too, there are several interesting new developments underway, and that's true in some other countries, too. Now, the challenges that face any developer of a new nuclear technology are daunting. And there are plenty of people who say, look, today's light water reactor technology is safe enough. It's a lot better than the plants that, uh, that uh, melted down at Fukushima. And that instead of searching for something better, we should be concentrating on bringing down the cost of what we already have through standardization, learning by building a series of these plants, and so on. And certainly, we should be doing those things. But to argue that that's all we should be doing seems to me to be short-sighted. Indeed, I believe that we're still at the early stages of nuclear uh, energy development. I'd like you to remember that it's still less than 75 years, or about 75 years, since the nuclear fission reaction was first demonstrated. Chronologically speaking, that puts the field of nuclear engineering today roughly where the field of electrical engineering was in the year 1900, 80 years after the great discoveries in electrochemistry and elect electromagnetism by Faraday and others. Think about what the electrical engineers then achieved. The creation of the electric power grid, one of the greatest engineering achievements uh, of, the, of the 20th century. <coughs> Radio and television. The revolutions in microelectronics, computation, telecommunications, the internet, and so much more. Really an astonishing series of advances, not one of which was anticipated, to my knowledge, by the electrical engineers of 1900, or for that matter, by anybody else. Likewise, no one today can foresee the range of practical applications of nuclear science and technology at the end of the 21st century. Perhaps the most we can say is that the nuclear power plants of the year 2100 are likely to have about as much resemblance to today's workhorse light water reactors as a modern automobile has to a 1911 Model T Ford. Perhaps we'll see more emphasis on passive heat removal mechanisms. The new generation of advanced light water reactors has moved in this direction but more advanced designs go much further towards the goal of walk-away safety. And we might ask, is it so unlikely that this goal will become a requirement for all nuclear power reactors 50 or 100 years from now? Other longer-term possibilities include lifetime fueling, giving a reactor a single charge of fuel, letting it operate for its whole 20 or 30 or 40 year life without ever are refueling it. Integrated power plant waste disposal systems with spent fuel never leaving the power plant site and the waste disposed of directly in modular deep boreholes several miles below the Earth's surface in the stable dry bedrock that is abundantly available in most countries. And maybe just as an aside, the extraordinarily high levels of public anxiety we see today over even very low levels of radiation won't necessarily persist over these 100-year uh, uh, time frames. Unlikely as it might seem to all of us today, it's not entirely far-fetched to speculate that one consequence of the ongoing revolution in molecular biology will be to transmute the deep-seated fear of radiation as a hidden, silent menace 
into a somewhat more benign view of it as one of many pervasive and routine environmental insults with well understood consequences for human cell biology and human health. In the nearer term, there are hopes that much smaller nuclear power reactors will expedite the application of advanced manufacturing techniques, modular construction technologies, and learning effects. Reductions in capital at risk, shorter project lead times, better matching with small power grids, and increased flexibility may make small reactors especially well suited to new nuclear countries as well as to many nuclear operators in mature nuclear states. In the nearer term, too, tremendous gains in computing power already enable much more precise simulations of nuclear reactor behavior than ever before and are opening up radically different and more rapid and more efficient approaches to design. Computational advances may also make it possible to design and build radiation resistant materials at the atomic scale and to create ultra secure materials to encapsulate nuclear waste with lifetimes of tens of thousands of years. All of this we can actually imagine today. Much greater advances surely lie over the horizon where we can't imagine them today. The people who are going to lead these innovations won't be the current leaders of the nuclear industry. Instead, they'll be the uh, next generation of very smart, dedicated young men and women who, at least in the United States, have been entering nuclear science and engineering departments and programs in increasing numbers over the last decade. And based on what I see in my department at MIT, as well as other American universities, this group of students is serious, idealistic, and also practical. They see great engineering challenges in designing and building new kinds of nuclear power systems that are safe and economic. They see an opportunity to ameliorate the threat of climate change. And they believe that nuclear energy is the only low carbon energy source that is both inherently scalable, uh, scalable and already capable of generating large amounts of electricity. I'm old enough to remember the period immediately after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Most of you, some of you, are not. But in that period, many of the smartest nuclear scientists and engineers left the field. And a lot of other people chose not to enter it. Partly, that was because of the uncertain prospects for the nuclear industry, obviously. But it was also because the industry itself became more cautious, more inward looking, and more reluctant to change. And for many young, promising technological leaders who were eager to make their mark in a dynamic environment, that was the signal that it was time to move on and move somewhere else. That experience cannot be repeated today. We cannot afford uh, to see that happen. Because the need for the vitality and flexibility and creativity of new generations of engineers, maybe people, some of the people in this room, to enter into the nuclear field and contribute to these uh, innovations has really never been greater. So let me just finish up here, we'll have quite a bit of time for questions, by going back to the beginning and just sort of summarizing what this whole uh, discussion has been about. In the energy world, the greatest need we have is for innovation. The greatest constraints we have are on money and capable people. And the greatest enemy we have is time. So let me finish there and we can, I think, have, how long, 20 minutes for, um, for Q&A.